following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, may the Holy Spirit rest upon us. May we be free of the distractions of this day, this week, and our hearts and minds ready to receive it. Help us to hear your message clearly. As we hear this message, please show us your truth and what you want us to learn. Point out the things in our thinking and our life that aren't right. Help us to remember that your word is life and always true. Use the truth of your word to change our thinking and our behavior. Let the truth build our faith, and let our faith guide our actions. God, we praise you for the message you have for us today, and we just lift up our pastor in prayer as he delivers it. We pray for this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you would, let's open up our Bibles together uh, to the book of Colossians. One last time. Crazy to think we're done with the book of Colossians. Um, every time I get to the end of a sermon uh, series, I call them series, which is really just walking through the books of the Bible. It's not a series, it's a book. Um, I want to do it again. So next week we're going to start in Colossians chapter 1, verse, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's, it's awesome because the Bible speaks to us no matter if we're 18 or 48 or uh, 88, right? And it constantly just speaks to us where we're at in life, and, and it um, calls us to conform to the image of Christ. So Colossians chapter uh, 4, um, we're going to be in verse 7, and we're going to walk to the end of this chapter in verse 18. And um, then after this week, as Bethany alluded to, uh, we are having a, a baptism service uh, next week. So uh, by all means, uh, come and, and see what God has done these past couple of months at Community Gospel Church. It will be such an encouragement to your heart. Um, it's awesome to see people get baptized. And then uh, we're moving into Christmas, like, because it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> There's Christmas music blasting in my house. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> Man, I, I have not heard more Christmas movies. I think we're like three Christmas movies deep already right now. Um, so I live with Mrs. Claus. I mean, I'm telling you what, there's 27 boxes downstairs that come out. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done at the Muck House right now. So uh, just pray for us. Uh, but we're excited about Christmas. We're going to do a classic Christmas this year. So we're going to talk about all those classical uh, passages that we have in the Gospels and how those relate to our everyday life and how we can really honor the Lord in this. Uh, we call it an Advent season, not a Christmas season. Advent means coming, that Christ came, and then we celebrate the fact that he's coming again soon. Um, so really, Advent is a reminder that Christ is coming again, too, as well. Um, so we're there. Uh, as we look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, um, as I was uh, studying for Colossians chapter 4 to, to bring it to you, a dear friend of mine from high school, um, he, uh, his mom actually, had posted pictures of his daughter who is graduating from high school. And so I texted him and I said, hey man, I don't know if you know this or not, but your daughter is graduating from high school. And he said, I know, we're old, Right? And I said, no, you're old. <laughs> My kids are still in school. Um, but the end of the, the text message was really interesting. He said, I hope and pray all is well. It's been a long time since we have talked. All of our buddies over here just say hello, and uh, we hope that you're well in Bremen. 
And it just uplifted my heart. Have you ever got a text message like that? Somebody who just says, hey, it's just so good um, to, to think about you. And then they, they send you this message and they say they're, they're so excited. And then there's all these other friends, too, as well that are, are kind of around them. It encourages you. And that's exactly what is happening here in Colossians chapter 4, what Paul is doing, the Apostle Paul, at the end of the letter to the Colossians. He is writing a church who is filled with his friends. He's writing a church of of all of these people who he holds near and dear to his heart, and he writes them a letter. He's in Rome. He's in prison for the gospel. And if you were at the church of Colossae back then when Paul's letter came, you would have been so encouraged to hear some of the names that Paul was reading off because it would have encouraged your heart too as well. You would have heard all these names and you would have thought about these memories and feelings of joy and all of the, 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 the times that you got to spend together with these people. And then you would have realized it wasn't just an individual effort. It was a collective effort between so many people striving to make Christ known in all of their lives regardless of where they found themselves. So, Oftentimes when we get to the end of a passage of scripture, we just burn through it, right? We read through it because we can't pronounce any of these names anyway. And so we just kind of rush through this passage of scripture. But really, if we study it as we're going to today and we see all these names, it's going to remind us of how important friends are in our life. Now, at the end of the sermon, I'm going to talk to you about three circles of friendship. You have a circle of intimacy, and we're going to say that these circles are kind of like a bullseye. You have a circle of intimacy that's reserved for your spouse. You have a second circle, which is the circle of influence, which is those people who you allow to influence you in your life, who should influence you in your life. And then you have a circle of concern. These are people on the outer circle that you wished would come to know Christ. You don't necessarily let them speak into your life. You're concerned about them. If we were to look at these these passages this morning in the lens of this scripture that is given to us, we would realize that this is Paul's circle of influence. These are people who are around him that really influence his life. It's also been said that you are the sum total of your five closest friends. Think about that. Some of them might even be here. Sometimes you look at that and you think to yourself, I'm in trouble. (laughs) And sometimes you look at that and you say, I don't even have five friends. And so what we're doing here is we're evaluating our friendship circles, seeing where we're falling short, and asking God to fill those circles. And then maybe we need to do some renovations this morning with our circles and the people we allow to influence us and the people who we influence as well. So there's an importance here of friends and companions in the faith. Let's start at verse 7 as we evaluate our friends. Okay. This name is, is just, I mean, we have got in a fight this week about this name, all right? His name is Tychicus, and I promise you that is how you pronounce it, and if it's not, then you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> nana nana boo boo, all right? <clears throat> Tychicus will tell you he's also dead. Nobody knows how to pronounce his name anyway, so there's that. Paul writes, Tychicus will tell you about my activities, He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, and he's a fellow servant in the Lord. I sent Tychicus to you for this very purpose, that you would know how we are doing and that he may encourage your hearts. Encourage your hearts should be underlined twice in your Bible. With him is another man. We'll get there in just a second. This is going to be kind of like a bunch of mini sermons thrown into one, but what I want you to do is evaluate your friendship circles right now. Number one on Paul's list in regards to a good friend was Tychicus, who is a humble and submissive friend. Everybody needs a humble and submissive to Christ friend. Tychicus was a leader in the church, and he also was a mailman. He delivers the, uh, the, the letter to the Colossians to the church. Did you catch that? And he wants to inform and encourage them on how his dear friend Paul is doing. Tychicus is a dear brother to Paul. He is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21. And from the providence of Asia, he comes, Acts 20 tells us. And Paul says Tychicus is three things. Number one, he is beloved. You should circle that word beloved. 
That means he is dearly loved and it is only used as believers. I send you an email every single Friday as a church and I say, beloved church family and friends, you are the beloved of God because you are in Christ Jesus. So Tychicus is first of all a believer, which means that everybody in our circle of influence needs to be believers. If you have somebody who is influencing you who is not a believer, they are not a real friend and they need to be moved outside to the circle of concern. Tychicus is also, though, too, a brother, a brother, all right, anyway, um, literally meaning one from the same womb, but they're not related here. He's talking about brothers in Christ, united in the gospel of Jesus. Tychicus is also three, faithful. He is trustworthy. Paul trusts him with this letter to take it to the church of Colossae. He is also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, dependable. He is reliable. Who is your friend in your life who is trustworthy, dependable, and reliable? Who is that? If you do not have any of these friends, then you should write on the piece of paper that is in front of you, God, help me to find, open my eyes to a person who is faithful, trustworthy, and dependable. So oftentimes we forget the power of prayer, asking God to bring people into our lives. He is a servant, meaning he loves energetically and he is persistent in his passion to serve others. Now, the word tychicus is really interesting because actually it means fidelity. Fidelity means continuing to be faithful to an obligation, a trust, or a duty. We use fidelity when we talk about electronic devices, right? The fidelity of the TV. <laughs> we were watching a Christmas movie, ironically, the other day, and I told my girls, you don't know about tracking on VHS tapes. <laughs> Remember that? Some of you guys are like, you don't know about color in regards to television, so don't talk to me about that, right? Regardless, fidelity is an accurate reproduction of its effect as a sound or picture. And Tychicus is accurately reproducing Christ. He is a humble and submissive friend. He cares for others without caring about a title. He could care less about his title. He just wants to serve. Who is your humble, submissive friend? Verse 9. Onesimus is with Tychicus as well. He is our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Verse 9. So Onesimus is from the church of Colossae, and he is also a mailman. They will tell you everything that has taken place to Paul. Onesimus is a transformed friend. The story of Philemon is, the, is my absolute, hands-down favorite book of the Bible. It is phenomenal. I love to preach it. I love to, to, to read it over and over again. Essentially, long story short, Onesimus was a converted runaway slave of a man named Philemon, which is the title of the letter that we have from Paul. Philemon is believed to be a pastor or a man who had a church in his home, but he was a faithful and beloved brother to Paul. And Onesimus essentially steals everything from Philemon, and he runs away, and he meets Paul, and he is converted to Christ. Onesimus escorts Tychicus with the Colossian letter as he gives a report on Paul's circumstances about what's happening in jail. The story of Philemon and Onesimus is a beautiful picture of law, specifically Roman and Mosaic law, versus the grace of God. Philemon has the right as a slave owner to punish Onesimus, but Paul says in the letter of Philemon, he says, whatever Onesimus stole from you, I will repay. And it shows the grace of God in a man's life. Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord. He has an, a massive debt, and he shows just how great God is by paying for those sins. And Onesimus becomes a brother in Christ, and it lays a foundation for uh, the um, abolishment centuries later of this master-slave relationship because in Christ they are one. Onesimus is a transformed friend. He is a friend of Paul who has come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ because of his ministry. He is somebody who has been discipled by Paul. He's talked to him about Jesus. Onesimus was on the circle of concern. Paul leads him to the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he moves into the circle of influence. 
And as he moves to the circle of influence, he says, this is my friend. This is my uh, 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 brother who has had a transformation because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Onesimus shows us that it appeals to all kinds of people. Look at this. Philemon, who is a slave owner, comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior. A rebellious slave like Onesimus comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior. A scholar like Paul, who used to be Saul, who is technically both, comes to know Jesus. The gospel does its greatest work under the skin. You need to let it do that great work in your life. The person in your life who desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that far gone yet. They can always be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever give up on the people in your circle of concern. Because who knows, they might come into your circle of influence when they come to know Christ. Verse 10. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. He's with me. So we have two guys who are mail carriers, and then we have a couple of guys who are actually with Paul. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. It's funny how church needs instruction from many people. If he comes to you, and it it seems like he gave him a hard instruction because Paul says, welcome him, right? It's almost like, hey, remember that guy that gave us bad news? Don't like shun him, welcome him in. Um, So you have Aristarchus and you have Mark. Aristarchus is from the Thessalonians, he is, excuse me, he is a Thessalonian who accompanied Paul on his third missionary journey. So Paul has three big missionary journeys in the, in the Bible. In Acts chapter 19, we see Aristarchus was one of those guys. He is either attending Paul in prison or he's incarcerated with him. We're not really sure which one. But Mark is who we want to focus on. Mark is also known as John Mark, and he is Barnabas's cousin and a companion of Paul that was on his first missionary journey. In Acts chapter 12, we see the connection. Mark was later an associate of Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter calls him my son. And we focus on Mark because something happens in Acts chapter 15, verse 37. You don't have to go there. I'll just give you the summary of it. Mark deserts Paul on his journey. Mark deserting Paul was a source of massive friction between Paul and Barnabas, who are working for the gospel. Barnabas wants to take Mark on the second missionary journey, but Paul doesn't trust him. He questions his loyalty and he refuses to take him with him. This leads to such a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they separate in their ministries. One guy goes this way and another guy goes this way because of one man, the man who is mentioned in the end of the letter to the Colossians. Fortunately, by the time Paul writes Colossians, Mark became a changed man and was restored to being useful, probably by Peter. Peter does some really good work after Jesus is ascended to the right hand of God. But one of those great works is Peter restores Mark to his uh, future success, probably because Peter was pretty good at failure in his life. And what we learn is Mark is a restored man friend. Mark is a restored friend. A man Paul once rejected becomes one of his greatest helpers. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 11, it says, as Paul writes to a young Timothy who's pastoring a church, pick up Mark, bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Well, what happened between Acts chapter 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 is, There was a restoration of the relationship. There is somebody probably in your life who you have broken the relationship because of something that happened. And what I'm learning is, as time progresses, oftentimes when we have a breaking of our relationships, we don't even remember what happened. We can't recall those things. But we realize that God wants us to be restored, not just to him, but to others as well. And so Mark gets a second chance. He's back, and Paul rejoices to have him. He's a faithful friend now. He forgives and forgets. Who is the person in your life who is a restored friend? Who is maybe the person in your life who could be in your circle of influence who could be a restored friend, but you're too stubborn 
to go after and reconcile that relationship. Remember, if God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances, uh, we should be too as well. Verse 11. And Jesus, who is called Justice, thanks for the clarification, Paul. There are uh, the only, these are the only men of the circumcision. So let's, let's group these guys together. You have Aristarchus, Mark, and then you have Jesus, who is called Justice. We're going to call him Justice from here on out, um, who are all together. And these are men of the circumcision, meaning they're probably Jews. And they are among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. They have been a great comfort to me. Justice is what we would call a proclaiming friend. Do you have one of these friends in your life that just can't stay quiet? And they just talk a lot, right? If you can't think of that friend, I'm that friend, okay? They just have a hard time keeping their mouth closed. And when they do open their mouth, they're always talking about Jesus. You have one of those friends? We call these people our awkward friend, right? Like, here we go. Every time we go out with you, you start talking about Jesus to somebody else, right? Can't you just calm down? Justice would have been that guy. Justice is a common Jewish name, so it's good that Paul calls him Justice to avoid confusion. Or Jesus, excuse me, is a common name. And Justice means righteous. And as we look at Justice, we realize that his work and his words comfort Paul as it shows that he is not just loyal to Paul, but to Christ. Now, circle that word comfort. That's really interesting. This is a really interesting word. It, it means encouragement, relief, or consolation, and it really holds a medicinal uh, name attached to it. It was a medicine way back in the New Testament that was given to infants as kind of a sedative that would soothe and quiet their aches and pains. Some of you parents are like, bring on the comfort, right? But justice being a proclaiming friend, and what Paul says is, He's saying that he is a soothing, quiet influence on me to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't it precious to think that while Paul's in prison, deprived of his liberty to preach, his fellow workers, by the activities in their preaching and teaching the gospel, are soothing and quieting influence to them. What a great comfort it is to know that they're doing the work. Who's your friend that proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ and encourages you to do the same? They should be in your circle of influence. It is awesome to have believing friends who encourage you by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Ephorus, who is one of you, again, another member of the Colossian church, much like Onesimus, is a servant of Christ Jesus. He greets you. He's obviously with Paul. And he's always struggling on behalf in your prayers. This guy is so important. He is always struggling in behalf of you in his prayers that you may stand mature and be fully assured in the will of God. For I bear witness, he gets more than one sentence, he gets like three, that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and for Hierapolis. Ephorus is a praying friend. Who's the person in your life who prays for you verbally and non-verbally? Who's the person in your life who constantly talks to God on your behalf? I would say this is the biggest person of influence that needs to be in your friendship circles. This is a powerhouse, if you will. Ephorus, like Onesimus, is a Colossian. And Paul says he is always struggling on your behalf. The wording on behalf in his prayer is like Jacob did with the angel in Genesis 32. His primary concern was for the church in Colossae to stand mature and be perfect and fully assured in the will of God, which fits the overall theme of Colossians to have believers be mature or perfect in Christ. Now, notice this. Ephesus' prayer wasn't occasional. It just wasn't flippant. Hey, man, I'm praying for you. That's not how it worked. Ephesus' prayer was what we call a hard prayer. Have you ever heard somebody say that? I oh, Man, I'm just praying real hard. I'm like, what's that look like? I'd really like to know what that looks like. Like, this is me praying normal. It's me praying hard. I don't know how it works. <clears throat> but Ephesus prayed hard. He was aware of the spiritual dangers in the church, and he had a heart like a true shepherd. 
I'm reminded of a story as I was reading that. There was a pastor, and he uh, would go in his study on Saturday night, and then he would leave his study, and he would go into the church by the back door. He did this every single week. People are constantly curious, what is this pastor doing? He's studying, we could see the lights on, and then he goes into the back of the sanctuary, and then he kind of disappears for a few hours, and then he comes back. What is happening with pastor? Well, the little kid kind of figured it out. He realized, and he kind of spying on him. He said, the pastor goes into the sanctuary, and he walks around pew by pew, and he prays individually for the people who will be present in those pews the next Sunday. Some of them by name, he knows where they sit, and so he prays for them. And he spends a lot of time just pouring out his heart for those individual people. Did you know your elders do that, by the way? Did you know your elders here at Community Gospel Church, they pray for you by name? We have what we call sections of the church that we uh, look after, and the elders help shepherd the flock, and they look at those little sections, and they pray for you by name before you even enter into the church. You're kind of like Ephorus who prays and has a passion to see God work in the flock. Ephesus is a praying friend. What if not only the pastor of that small church prayed like this, but all the people of God prayed like this? You know, somebody asked me, uh, this was last week, somebody asked me, they said, do you have a committee for this certain ministry? And they were talking about evangelism. And I said, no, because everybody in the church evangelizes. We don't have a group of people who uh, just pray because the whole church is called and commanded to pray. Amen? So it's not just designated for one specific ministry. We're all called to do this. Some people are just a little bit better at it than others. Ephesus is a praying friend. He is a model of prayer, and we should follow that. Who is that in your life? Now, notice there's something really interesting. Ephesus' prayers also went to believers in the uh, Lysus Valley, like Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis. So he didn't just pray for the church of Colossae and for Paul. He also prays for the entire body here, okay? So that's what he means by that. So it's like praying for the church in South Bend and Plymouth and Wawasee and all of those things. All right, verse uh, 14, we're getting there. Luke, the beloved of... Luke's there too? All right, why not? Um, Luke... The beloved physician greets you. Got to have a good doctor around, all right? Um, As does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers in Laodicea and Nyphia and the church in her house. Now, this is a little sad tale. Demas is a friend who was in the circle of influence that moved to the circle of concern. Demas deserted Paul. He is a friend that has gone bad. Luke writes, or excuse me, Luke is here with Paul. He's standing firm with Paul. He's in prison. And Demas, though, is really interesting. Demas has a similar story of Mark, but he doesn't rebound. Demas at one time was Paul's fellow worker in the gospel. He was right up there with Mark and Luke and all of these guys in Philemon 24. But he abandons Paul during his second imprisonment in Rome. So when things got tough, Demas took off. Demas chose the temporary worldly benefits of this world over the eternal riches of heaven. Got a friend like that? Somebody who you thought was, man, like they they love the Lord and they were passionate about Christ and then they took off. Demas is a friend God bad. We all have them. But Paul doesn't give up on them. I think that Paul puts his name in the letter because he really wants to see him restored. There will be those who seem to receive the word, but then Matthew 13, verse 22 comes to light. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Your past service is no guarantee of future faithfulness. Dependence on Christ can be your only strength. So we pray for our friends who have gone south, who have moved from the circle of influence to the circle of concern. Demas is a hard situation there, and we feel for Paul as he probably had tears in his eyes as he penned that Demas had deserted him. Fifteen. Two more. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nyphia and the church in her house. 
And when this letter has been read among you, have it read in the church of Laodiceans and even at Community Gospel. It's not in the text. I just added that. Just make sure you got that. All right. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And so what Paul is talking about there is the church. Paul asked the Colossians to give his greetings to the brothers at Laodicea. 30 years later, Jesus is going to have words for the church at Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Specifically, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. There's little known about this lady who lets a church meet at her house. The Laodicean letter may be the letter to the Ephesians, which is written about the same time. We just don't know. But here's what I love about this. Even though it's not in Paul's circle of influence, it really surrounds Paul's friendship circles, and that is the church. It is such a blessing and honor to gather here every Sunday. Amen? We come here, and it's so much fun to fellowship with everybody who's here. You guys have the craziest stories, and we talk about what happened in our week, and we talk about what's going on, what transpired, and all those other things. And then we realize just how crazy all of us really truly are, right? We just realize how different and distinct we are, but yet the commonality is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is thankful for that. He is so thankful for the church, who is all of his beloved friends, who is the family of God, which shows the local gathering is important. It was important then, it's important now, today. And then the last one, and then I'm out your way. Say to Archippus, and underline this twice, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. See that you have fulfilled the ministry that you have received from the Lord. Archippus is maybe, maybe the pastor of the church of Colossae. It's a little bit of a stretch. But regardless what we know of him, he's he's a working friend. He's a hard worker. He is believed to be Philemon's son, and he's ministering to Colossae. And Paul wants the Colossians to tell Archippus, to fulfill or complete his work, which is another example of Paul's concern that the Colossians be complete in Christ. Circle that word fulfill. In context, that word has the idea that means God has a definite purpose for his ministry and for your ministry. The person in your circle of influence who is Archippus should be somebody who works in your context and who has the same mindset Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. We are his workmanship, masterpiece or poem, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul's encouraged by Archippus because he is fulfilling his calling. We need people who lift us up in evangelism and edification efforts. Every believer has a God-given ministry in the Lord. You are all missionaries called To bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul says, he possesses a ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. And he encourages him. So you have three circles. The first circle, or the bullseye, is reserved for your spouse. The circle of intimacy is your spouse. If you ask me who I'd want to hang out with any day, whether it's Monday through Sunday, whatever it is, whatever time, it's Bethany. All the time. All of you take a back seat to her. She is my best friend. She is in my circle of intimacy, and nobody else gets the right to be in that circle. Not my kids, not my family, nobody. It's her and me. Now you look at it and you say, Whoa, hold on a second, Jordan. Where's Jesus in this whole thing? He is in the whole circle. He created the circles. People drive me nuts. They say, oh, I built my, my, my list. It's God first. My dad's was funny. It was God first, fishing second, my mom third, us fourth. And I said, you never put God at the top of your list because God should be in the list because he created the list. So hands down, my wife is my best friend. And those of you who are married, if your spouse is not your best friend, you need to work on that relationship first. You are called to be in completion with one another, not in competition to each other. That is the one relationship that I work on more than any other relationship besides my relationship with Jesus. Then we move into the circle of influence. Jesus had 12 ordinary men that he allowed to be in his life. Here's the hard thing. You're not Jesus. I don't think you can do 12 well. 
I think you maybe, maybe can do five or six. So who are the people who are in that circle of influence? Now, here's where it gets tricky. Men, your circle of influence should be men. Women, your circle of influence should be women. Not one woman sits in my circle of influence, and they never will. Because there's too much risk to let somebody who is a woman in my circle of influence move into my circle of intimacy. That's how affairs start. So my circle of influence, always, I look at Paul modeling it, I look at Jesus modeling it, and I realize that there are people that need to be there that are much like these friends that we talked about today. And if you look at that and you say, I don't have five people, and here's the other problem, you say, I don't have time for five people, then you're too busy and your priorities are messed up. You have to prioritize this. A relationship with God is vertical and horizontal. You need people in your life, and you need relationships in your life. And so in those circles, if you don't have those people there, you pray daily, hard, that God would open your eyes to see these friends and bring these friends into your life. And sadly, sometimes these friends, they'll, they'll go like Demas did. And that happens. It's part of life. But we keep moving on. And your circle of concern should always be people who don't know the Lord that you desperately, passionately want to see to come to know Christ. So we pray for these things. And look what Paul says at the very end, verse 18. I, Paul, write you this greeting with my own hand as a brother who loves you and cares about you, who is in prison for the gospel. There's nothing in it for him. It is all God's grace that should be with you because of these things. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, I just thank you so much for the, the book of Colossians and the way that it has spoken to our hearts in these past couple of months. I'm so thankful for your word and the way that it just, it just seeps into our life. And it convicts us and it teaches us and it calls us to conform not to our image, but to your image. And as we get to the end of Colossians and we look at all of these relationships that Paul had and how great they were, God, we ask that you would help us to model this too as well in our life. As we're sitting here today, we're thinking about our relationships that we have. We think about our relationship with you and how you loved us, and then you call us to love others. And so, God, today, would you help us to prioritize our circle of friends? If we're married, God, that you would help us to prioritize that relationship as a high priority, to love our spouse, as you loved us, to seek their best, as we already talked about in previous chapters in Colossians. Help us to love them as a way that Christ loved us and see the real benefit of completing one another and not competing with each other. Help us to realize as you put that person in our life for a reason and a purpose and that we would be with them as an act of worship. As we look at our circle of influence, the people who are influencing us, God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you convict some people here today, myself included, to really evaluate who is speaking into our life. And if there's anybody in that circle of influence that is, that is influencing us for anything but the gospel, but they would be removed from that circle. Push them out of that circle, God. Not because we don't like them, not because we don't love them, but because we see the importance of the people who need to speak into our life to build us up and the importance of giving tough love for people who don't know you as Lord and Savior. And for those of us who are here and we don't have a whole lot of friends, I pray, God, that we would be fervent in our prayers. We would pray for people to come into our life and we would be able to walk with and talk with and that we would point them to Christ and they would point us to Christ as we see all of these people who need to know Christ, help us do that too as well, to unapologetically share the gospel that we have received. And may our relationships always be edifying and encouraging as we see the day approaching. May we, God, work with people and not at them so that we would see that the day is almost here when you are coming back again. Help us to do diligence until that time. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.
Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.